Check, check. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here. See all your eyeballs. Welcome to Winthrop Street Baptist Church. Um, so as you know, Sammy and Pete are still trying to, to do this whole parenting thing. And uh, we did get to uh, get a little video with him this week and saw the baby. He is really adorable. Um, so just keep them in their prayers because you know how, how nervous new parents are and they think they're going to break Joey. But Joey's tough. He's tough. He's going he's gonna to survive. Um, we're going to welcome back Pastor Reuben again this morning. He's going to continue to bring the good news to us, and we're so blessed to have him this morning. And uh, just thank you all for being here today. All those watching on TV, good morning. We trust you had a good week in the Lord. Um, Jaron says, when I get up here, I can pick and read whatever I want. So this week, I'm going to pick Psalm 36, because last week, I might not have picked the right one, but we'll, we'll make it work today. It's God's word, so it's, it's a blessing to hear from it anyway. Um, thank you, Katie, also, just for your worship, and it's awesome to hear you playing guitar. It's amazing. Um, we're reading from Psalm 36 this morning. Uh, it's entitled, How Precious is Your Steadfast Love? And that's a theme that David writes about constantly in the Psalms, and it's super encouraging. Um, Psalm 36. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes, that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the, evildoer, there the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. And those are encouraging words for us, and it's always been encouraging in these times, but especially today, it seems, uh, we get, as uh, we heard a couple weeks ago, why do bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people. Uh, the Lord is in control of all of it, and the evildoers will lie fallen, unable to rise. So what an encouragement this morning. Thank you for your word, Lord. Join me in prayer. Father, we know that you are indeed in control of all things. Your steadfast love is being poured out every day, hour by hour, and in moment by moment in our lives. And Lord, it's when we forget and we take our eyes off of you that we feel the weight of the world and the pressures uh, and the struggles, and we see uh, the sins going on around us in, in our world, on our news, and we get discouraged. And then we come to church and we're reminded that you are an awesome God whose steadfast love is holding us up, is holding us fast. And Lord, I, I pray that we're also in our word every day, just being, being reminded of your goodness and your presence. Uh, thank you for the encouragement of Winthrop Street, Lord, that we are a gospel-centered church preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. For that is the light of the world, uh, that is the hope that we have, and that is truth. And we thank you that we stand upon that foundation, Lord. I pray your blessings upon the body of Winthrop Street, Lord, and I pray that we continue to be a light in these times. Uh, it's certainly historic going through the midst of this virus, and uh, Lord, we just need your presence more and more and more. Um, help us to cling to you, to seek you, and to hold fast to your truth and your gospel and our great Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you for all our brothers and sisters that are worshiping today in Taunton and around the world, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, and I pray that the gospel is the center of these churches and not entertainment or music or programs, uh, but Jesus is the focus, Lord, uh, because he is separating wheat from chaff, light from darkness, uh, goats from sheep, and he is our shepherd, and we hear his voice, and we want to follow him. We long for him, Lord. Uh, so I pray that we continue to seek you, and where we're not, help us to be repentant and turn back to you and ask for your wisdom to pour down upon us, Lord. Uh, lift up the DeAngelis' this morning and pray that you pour your grace upon them. Thank you for life, Lord. It is so precious. And you are the author of all life. 
And may we hold life uh, so precious in this nation, Lord. Uh, help our, our, our government govern that way. Help our leaders have that uh, concept in their minds that you are God. You create us in your image. And we need to uphold that image and, and love these precious children and babies and turn our nation to protecting the unborn, Lord, and do a mighty work in our midst. I thank you for Pastor Reuben this morning. I pray your blessing on him and his faithfulness to you and your word, that he encourages us uh, through uh, scripture this morning. I thank you for helping him, uh, helping him preach to us and, and, and fill in for Pete. Uh, what a blessing to have these brothers who love you and, and want to see a body encouraged uh, on the truth of Jesus, Lord. Uh, thank you for Katie and her talents. Bless the worship this morning. Bless those tithes and offerings that will be given. Uh, and Lord, uh, may the givers be cheerful and obedient and see you do amazing things through us, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Continue in worship. I'd like to invite you all to stand with me as we sing a couple of songs this morning. Um, the first one being In Christ Alone. Um, and the second one, um, we're going to do Seek Ye First, which was a request from our stand-in pastor this week. Um, it's just a beautiful song. I'm sure many of you have heard it. Um, just a reminder to us all to that, that if, we seek, if we seek God first before anything else, that he will provide and he will not forsake us. And it's just a, a beautiful reminder. So just keep those, those thoughts and words in mind as we sing these songs this morning.
Great job, guys. Great singing. Um, we're going to sing our doxology. Real quick. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Amen. Wow. I felt like I was singing with the angels. You may be seated. I'm serious. I brought tears to my, to my eyes. That doesn't happen very often. Wow. Thank you for leading us today. Have, has anybody ran into this situation in your life? You're walking in the store, and you're doing your thing, right? You're picking all your your groceries, or maybe you're at a gas station, you're starting to do your pump thing, or maybe you're just at an event, and you know, you're, you're mingling, you're talking with people, and then you recognize somebody walking by, and you don't know quite if that person's the person you, you think they are, all right? You guys been there before? 
And so you're at that awkward look, like place where you're like, mm, do I wanna, do I wanna go to this person and you know kind of tap them on the shoulder and give them a big hug? Well, we can't do hugging now, but uh, you know, t say hey, how are you doing? Or do I want? Am, am I that confident enough to in what I'm seeing to actually follow this person and try to engage with them? Well, I'm the type of person <laughs> who if I if I see somebody I kind of recognize, I'm gonna go up to them. <laughs> And there's been, I can't tell you how many times it's been, I, I you, know, say, you know, say something or, you know, grab him by the shoulder and say, hey, how are you doing today? Oh, that's not Dave. <laughs> or, hey, Isabel, oh, sorry, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it, it's, you kind of see the familiar face, you see the familiar even body postures. Maybe the person's, they're familiar, but they got a haircut recently, you know, I don't know. Um, but that familiarity, that, that, that intuition of wanting to go and, and catch up with them, or maybe not catch up, you know, take the risk of, you know, that embarrassment of, who are you, guy? <laughs> why, are you, why, are you why are you calling me Dave? Um, I see that we, too, can pass by some scriptures and not see the Lord in them. Or we, we pass by the scriptures and we don't, we kind of see a glimpse of what we, we think we know, but then we kind of keep on walking and, and, and miss the opportunity to kind of catch up with the Lord, to see what he has to say. And it's my hope in, in, in today's text that, that we would see that the Lord is providing us hope. He's given us hope. And he's given us, a, <laughs> he's providing us hope in the midst of chaos, and we're living in the chaotic world right now, aren't we? He's given us and providing us hope in the, in the form of representation. And he's given us hope in his establishing a kingdom and incorporating people into that kingdom. God has provided hope for us. So let's see that hope today. We're going to be in uh, Daniel 7, 13 through 14. God provides hope in the midst of chaos. Verse 13 starts to read, I saw in the night visions, and behold. I'm just going to stop there real quick. See, because verse 13 and, and verse 14, where we're going to be staying on for the remainder of, for the a majority of our, of our service together, it's in the middle of a, of, a, of a vision. It's in the middle of a vision. There's some things that have happened before. And even if you look at Daniel's history in the book of Daniel, how many of us are kind of familiar or have ever heard of Daniel the prophet? You know, I'm, I'm sure if I kept on asking, how many of you have heard of the lion's den? You know, our, our hands will stay up. Uh, how many have heard of the, the, the fiery fire with the three and the three friends of Daniel and the fourth one like the Son of Man, right? We've all kind of, we're kind of familiar with them, at least in that, with those two stories at the very minimum. But if we look at chapters one through six, we're going to see that Daniel, we're not going to go, we're not going to read the whole chapters, don't, don't worry. But we're going to see that Daniel uh, has written a narrative of what's happened in the life of, of himself and his three friends. And in that chapter one, you see that Daniel is, is and the, all the Jews, the, the southern kingdom, they are in exile in Babylon. They've been deported from Israel because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion, and their lack of heeding God's word to repent. And now they're, they're scattered. They're, they're brought into captivity. And Daniel and his friends are actually um, brought into a, a service role. Uh, they're, they're brought into like a boot camp for uh, that it's gonna, um, they're going to they're gonna be advisors for the, the kingdom, for, for Babylon, for Nebuchadnezzar. And in chapter 1, we see that they actually find favor in, in Babylon with the, the people who are training them and also with the king himself. And in chapter 2, that's where we see um, Daniel interpreting a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and saving really all the, all the scribes and all the, the, the wise people in, in Babylon because Nebuchadnezzar determined in his heart that he needed to know the dream. They needed to tell him what the dream was without him telling them, and they needed to interpret 
and nobody could do that. But Daniel, praying with his three friends, gets revelation from God, thanks God for that, and then tells the king the vision and the interpretation. In chapter 3 is where we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, rebuke, not rebuking, but they are resisting the edict to worship an uh, image that was set up by Nebuchadnezzar. And as a result, they are actually literally uh, found in a very hot spot. <laughs> they are found guilty by Nebuchadnezzar, and, and he gives them opportunity. Hey, if you just worship right now, you, you, won't, you won't die. And they say, nope, we're, we're going to re remain faithful to our God. And, and so they get thrown in the, the fire, and they survive. They are, they are um, preserved in that fire. And Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that. In chapter 4, uh, we see that Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar kind of collaborate real quick on a kind of autobi autobiography of, what, of how Nebuchadnezzar comes to realization that he is under a higher being. And he's, he has a vision and tells Daniel about it, and Daniel interprets it. And part of that vision was that he would be humbled, and he would walk around like a, like a wild animal for a certain period of time. And then the Lord would restore him back to his human self. And then, God, and then Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges again, God is greater than I am. And he's gracious. And then, then the story of Nebuchadnezzar ends. And then chapter 5 happens where either by Nebuchadnezzar's death or maybe Nebuchadnezzar had handed over the reins to his son Belshazzar. But Belshazzar... He one day decides to go ahead and throw a, throw a party and has all his, his favorite people around. And the party all of a sudden sees, it's like we're looking at the wall, they see a hand coming down. And it starts writing in this language that they don't understand or know. And so they're very perplexed. And Belshazzar was told about this guy named Daniel who actually helped his dad, Nebuchadnezzar, um, in such instances of, of bewilderment or puzzlement or, or uh, mystery. And so he, he calls Daniel in, and Daniel reads the, reads the words and tells him what it means. And basically it's saying, your kingdom's going to end. You're found wanting. And that night, Balshazzar is, is found dead, and the king of the Medes takes over the Babylonian empire, which leads us into chapter 6, where, where Darius, the, the king of Persia, He's tricked into making an edict preventing prayer from happening for any reason during a certain per period of time, unless it's prayer to some, uh, to, toward a certain other place. And Daniel refused to obey that edict, and he, he insisted on praying three times a day. And through that, through that edict and through that trickery that, that other scribes and other um, advisors had, had told Darius, he found himself having to um, put Daniel in that den of lions. And he didn't want to, because even in Darius's eyes, Daniel found favor. And of course, we know that Daniel was preserved in the lion's den. And Darius pulls him out the next morning. He calls out to Daniel, 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 are you still there? And Daniel says, I'm here. And the an angel of the Lord has prevented these beasts from eating me up. And Darius recognized the power of God and said, you know, Daniel's God is great and powerful. And that leads us to chapters 7 through 12, which if you, if you think about a narrative, you know, events have happened in, in, in order, okay? Chapter 7 through 12 are visions that, ha that happened somewhere in between these narratives or at some point in the narratives. And that's where we find ourselves in chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we, we're, we're at a place where um, Belshazzar just became, became king. And Daniel's given a vision of four beasts coming out of a sea. And these beasts were horrific. They were mutated animals, like four heads and, you know, a leopard with wings and stuff. And I don't really want to get into all the details about these, these beasts and what they... What they you know, wh wh who they can be pointing to. But I wanted to say that they are symbolizing the kingdoms that will follow. They are symbols of humanity striving to establish our own 
reign, our own dominion, our own rule in our current fallen state. And it's because of this that when we see they come out of the, the, the seas, the seas in the ancient world, when Daniel was writing, represented a chaotic, dis, disorganized, distorted um, uh, place that was mysterious and, and just could not be tamed. And the fact that these beasts come out of it and they represent kingdoms shows that ever since Genesis 3, where humanity has distorted the image of God, where we re rebelled and distorted our created order, as a result, the outcome of that has led to these funny-looking beasts of kingdoms, of reigns, of dominions that will all be dealt with. And they all are corrupted. They are all out of order, out of God's created order. Look at, I mean, just think about a, a four-headed animal is not natural. Uh, a leopard with wings, that's not in, the God, in God's created order. So it's, a, it's the outgrowth of man's rebelliousness and disobedience that produces a governance that, that is disordered, distorted and rebellious and, and disobedient. They actually typify the horrors of human evil. In some cases, really bad, like oppression, like killing and, and genocide. So with verse 13, you might ask me, how in the world are you seeing hope in chaos? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> but before we get to that question, I just, wanna, I just want us to put ourselves in the, the shoes, if you will, of the people who heard this message from Daniel, who heard this vision from Daniel. What it, what, how would they respond to this? And I think their response would be, They'd hear the, the vision at this, to this point, and they'd be like, are you, are you kidding me? There's more? There's more of this? Captivity and rebellious kingdoms rising and, and taking what, you know, being boastful, being corrupted, being oppressive. See, because they were longing for a different kingdom. If you look at Genesis 12, the, the, the promise to Abraham of him being a blessing to the world, but also having a land, a people who, who were numerous as, star, as the stars of the sky and as, as numerous as the sand on the sea. And also that they, he would be a bless his nation, this nation would be a blessing to the, to the world. They hadn't realized, this, this promise had not been realized in Israel's history. They also saw the Mosaic promise of, of, of one that was going to be like Moses who would teach them and explain the things of the law. They also looked at the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promises David, the, the king, the, the, you know, the best king that Israel has had, the, the man after God's own heart. And he, God promised him, I'm going to have your descendant sit on the throne forever and ever. They had not realized this promise either. They, this king, this eternal king, had not come to existence. It, that had not come to fruition yet in, in the history of Israel. And then the vision continues, and, it's, and it shows that God sits in the throne of judgment, and he judges these, these kingdoms that would, and this judgment would end history as we know it. And then he would, he would not only judge them, but he would dismantle them, their rule, their dominion, and their power. So where's the hope in this chaos? Well, I, that's where verse 13 actually th comes in pretty strong. Because through, through the vision so far, it's been just descriptive, a bunch of descriptions. And then he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold. This was like a pause in the visions. If you will, it was kind of like a reset getting them, getting the, the, the people ready for the hope that was to come, even in the midst of all this crazy chaos and the, the product of humanity's rebellion, this product of, of establishing governance that was in rebellion to God. And he pauses here, and he kind of resets and gives us 
a glimpse, a breath, a breath of fresh air in the midst of this chaotic stuff that they just heard, in this chaotic experience that they know because they are in captivity too. And then it's in this pause and in this reset that we actually see the hope in the midst of chaos, which springboards us to the next point, that God provides hope in representation, if we continue. And behold, I saw in the night visions, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. See, the difference between these, these kingdoms uh, that were spawned out of the chaos was that this one who's like the son of man, and if you didn't know, if we were walking by in the store, we take a double take on who this one is. This one is the Messiah. This is Jesus. And the difference between these other kingdoms and this one is the fact that these other kingdoms are the distortion, the result of a distorted, um, the distorted governance. But this one brings us back to how it was supposed to be. Hum human, 100% serving and, and being presented to God. See, unlike these distortions, this one, like the, like the Son of Man, came to res restore humanity, to redeem humanity back to its original state, Genesis 1 and 2. Humanity and rebellion creates disorder, but this one brings us back into order. So that way, his, this image is not a distortion of, of a weird animal with four heads and wings and stuff, right? This is a human, a human government, a human governance. And see, these distortions were distortions of the way God had designed. But in this Son of Man, it's been redeemed. Humanity is being redeemed. So much so that this Jesus has taken on the human flesh and became the new face or the new head of humanity. And Paul says something like this. He talks about the old Adam and the new Adam. And he says in uh, Romans 5, 17 through 19, For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace in the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, we're all in Adam, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. God provides hope in representation. The question is, are we being represented by the old Adam? Or are we going to be represented by the new Adam, the new head, the new race of humanity, if you will, the restored and redeemed race? Who is Jesus? Well, he's presented before the ancient of days, before the Father. And if you look at the ways that, that the, these old uh, kings and kingdoms were taking their authority, taking their dominion, by force, with, with pride and with haughtiness, by boasting, this one came in humility and he was presented before him, before the ancient of days. You know, that song we, we sung said something like this, Since, uh, sin's curse lost its grip on me. That's because for that person who has faith in Jesus, sin is no longer the slave master. We are out of the slavery that, and the trajectory of slavery that Adam threw us in, just like Romans 5 said. Now we are set free. 
And again, Jesus said, you know, I came to give life. I came to give freedom. And that's exactly what he's doing here. You also recognize that the clouds, that he's riding on the clouds, this shows just like what John does in, in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. See, in, in the same way John depicts and shows Jesus as 100% God and 100% man, so here we see Jesus being divine and man. That's an amazing combination because we, we can never, we can't dive into that deep enough. But know this, even though we may not 100% comprehend it, the truths are in the scripture. He is God in the flesh. He is the God-man, the only one who, in obedience, represented us so that way we can be redeemed, so that way we can step in, light, in, in line with him in obedience. And it's because that he is God that he could take on the sins of all humans for all time as a perfect man, paying our price, dying on the cross, being buried for three days, taking, taking the death that we deserved, bearing our sins and then freeing us through his resurrection so that way we can live in newness of life, live inside this new existence of being born again, like he says in John 3, where, where waters bubble up because we're filled with the Spirit now. God provides hope in representation, and that representative for our new humanity, for our new existence as believers, is Jesus. He's the one that steps in. He's the one that has become that new head for us. And not only that, he establishes a, a new kingdom. A kingdom that was, again, promised in, latter, in earlier days. God provides hope through establishing his kingdom. Verse 14 reads, And to him, this son of man, the one, the cloud rider, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom in all peoples, nations, and languages to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This vision is prophetic. It's talking about the end of the story for humanity, where God will finally, at the end, put an end to all the chaotic governances that we know and have seen ex exist. And he establishes his own kingdom, a kingdom that will last forever, fulfilling the, the promise to David that his king, his son, one in his lineage, that beaten Jesus, would be an eternal king reigning in his throne forever and ever. It's, it's repeated here. He has an everlasting dominion. But the reality is this, and it's not that this is not true, it's that the way that Jesus did this was different than what the Jews had expected. See, the Jews, just like in Jesus' days, expected a, a Messiah just like Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14 expected and, and depicts. One who comes at, at the end of the age and demolishes all the, the evil governances that humanity has established and then sets up his own kingdom. But then Jesus starts to talk about now the Son of Man must be lifted up. And the, and the people were saying, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? The Son of Man is supposed to be here forever and have an eternal reign. How, are you, how can you say that he must be lifted up, that he must suffer? Well, that's part of the, the kingdom that he has established. It's actually a, a, a act of grace for us that he did not come in this way the first time. Because now, from, from Jesus' time to the time he comes back again, from his first appearance, in the human flesh, to the time he comes riding on the clouds, like Matthew 24 says, 
he is allowing people to come to him. He's bringing people into his kingdom, so much so that he says that the church is advancing into the kingdom of darkness. And we are actually charging the gates of Hades. And we're bringing people into the kingdom. So my question is, how are we advancing the kingdom in our lives? Are we? If we were to give ourselves a grade, you know, every, a lot of our kids here are going to be going to basically homeschool maybe this next year. What's our grade like wh when it comes to our reaching out to those around us to, to bring them into the kingdom? How are, how are we being obedient to Jesus' words when he says in Matthew 28, all authority has give, been given to me. Does that sound familiar? All authority, all dominion, all glory has been given to the, the one, the Son of Man. Therefore, go, make disciples of the nations, baptizing and teaching them to obey, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always. I, I'm going to be with you always throughout this whole process from the time I'm ascended to the time I come back. I'm still with you. I've given you a promise. I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit. Go in that same authority because we are now part of that kingdom. And if you, what's great about Daniel, this, this specific passage, is that he, he's, he seeks an a interpretation in that same vision. And part of that interpretation repeats what he says here in verse 13 and 14 and repeats a lot of the other uh, interpretation of what the vision was before. But for th verse 13 and 14, it goes something like this. He says, you know, the, the people of the saints, they are the ones that are going to inherit the dominion and glory and kingdom. And theirs will be an everlasting dominion. Bec and it's, then it goes back to the first person, thir third person singular, because he will reign, essentially, Okay. So we, as God's people, thinking about it, we are brought into co-regency with Christ. And we will be at the end of the age where he will reign forever and ever. And we are co-heirs with him. I think that's an astounding thing. We have an, uh, obtained an inheritance. If you read Ephesians 1, for example, just read through Ephesians 1. We have, an, uh, we have obtained an inheritance. And not only that, we have been sealed in, with the promised Holy Spirit. And that's a guarantee for our, our inheritance. This is like a down payment. And it's not a small down payment. It's like 90% of the down payment's been done. Now the next phase of, of the payment plan is Jesus coming back and establishing his literal physical kingdom where he will reign forever and ever where Isaiah points to and it says the lion will sit with the lamb the nations will be at peace all peoples nations and languages will be represented in that kingdom revelation says that you know the the, the there will be a multitude of tongues worshiping and glorifying God you know why that is because God did not want to focus on one specific group and let that group just sit there and do nothing. He intends that group to bring others of different ethnicities, others of different tongues, others of different social background, economic background. He wants to bring other people into his kingdom so that all nations, all peoples, and all languages are represented and they will worship him, and they will give him glory. Our job, church, is to seek, is to <laughs> go to the gates of Hades. Notice it's the gates of Hades. It's not the, it's not the church's gates. It's not the kingdom's gates. Jesus says it, it's the gates of, the, you will charge the gates of Hades. We're on a move, we're on the advance and we're pulling people out of that kingdom of darkness. If you keep on reading about Ephesians, or in the book of Ephesians, you'll see that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but
but against powers and principalities of the air. The kingdom of darkness was infused with the light of the world, and we didn't recognize him. Thanks be to God that he enlightened our eyes and made us to see who he was and who he is and who he will be. See, this hope is not just for now, though it is very encouraging, and it actually gives us energy for our work in, in our world today. But this hope is for future. It's going to happen. And so if you, didn't, if you don't get anything from this message, from Daniel seven thirteen to 14, I want you to, get, to hear this. Stay faithful in your heart and mind by focus, focusing on the hope that God provides. Stay faithful in how you act and how you behave, how you engage. Stay faithful in your heart and mind by focusing on the hope that God provides. And he's provided a hope in the midst of chaos where we can see the governance, the fallen governance of humanity not quite cutting it, falling short of God's glory, right? We know that we all fall short, of, sh fall short of God's glory. We see that God provides hope in representation. Either we, we find hope in the true hope, Jesus, the Son of Man, or we seek for hope in the old Adam, in doing way, things the way that they've always been done. Where are we place, placing our hope in our lives? And then we find hope in the fact that he establishes his kingdom. He brings people into his kingdom. And that kingdom is already, we, we, can, we know it. We have a guarantee, a deposit in our lives, the Holy Spirit. But it's not yet. It's to come. It will be realized because God's promises do not come back void. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. Read through the prophets. He consistently talks about this kingdom and this eternal state where he re restores everything. Read Romans 8 where we, where we see that the creation groans for the, for the day of rest restoration. Even our own selves groan for the time when we will be and experience the full adoptions as sons and daughters of the Most High. Right now, we get, we get, a, we get the legal certificate. We know we're, son we're adopted. Then, it will be full, full on family, family party full-on feast, celebration, worship, glory to God for creating the way to him. Stay faithful in your heart and mind by focusing on the hope that God provides. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your people and your promises, Lord. May we be holding on to those promises, keeping them before us, Lord, focusing on the hope that you provide, namely that's found in Jesus and his first coming, which was monumental, but his second coming. Oh, Lord, on that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord. Help us to bring people to that place. Lead us to people to, to help them and walk by with them to bring them to that realization, Lord. Send your spirit into our lives, into the people around us, so that they would acknowledge now, before it's too late, that you are Lord. Because on that day, every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. Because they will all see you for who you are. And whether they identified with the new Adam, that you, with you, Jesus, or whether they continued on in their own old selves, in the old Adam, that will determine where they're going to be, Lord. And you have invited people into your kingdom. You've established your kingdom, and you put a, 
put, a, put us in a situation where we, we're still bringing people into that kingdom, Lord. We're part of that plan. And we want to thank you so much for that plan. And I pray that may the Lord, may you just give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of you, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that we may know what is the hope to which you have called us, what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believed and who believe according to the working of your great might that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in the age, this age, but also in the one that is to come. And you put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. May you do this for us. Help us to, to be your people in this world. In Jesus' name. You all want to stand with me? We're going to sing one more song. And join me in holy is the Lord.
are this morning. Lord, we thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you for your dominion. We thank you for your rule. We thank you that you used men like Moses and Abraham and David and Daniel to point the way to our great Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, he is coming again. And yes, the truth is it's hell or Jesus, Lord. We thank you for you being the great King and Savior who has overcome sin and death and hell through the truth of your way and your name and your power. And Lord, uh, may that fuel us this week to be in your word, to be that light, and pray and be in prayer to call those we love and know and live next to, call them, draw them to you, and use us in any way possible to that end, Lord, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.